From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deckant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Fellow conspiracy realist, John McAfee is dead. Over the course of his life, he was a study in contradiction, hyperbole, and arguably, at times, a study in genius. It's no secret that his views were extreme, and his stories and his own recollections at times were contradictory. He made and lost a fortune, at least. He loved the public spotlight, embraced it, and he died quite recently in a Spanish prison cell while awaiting extradition to the U.S. on a litany of charges. In today's episode, we're diving into the controversial twists and turns of his time on Earth, and we're seeking to suss out the answer to one burning question. Did he, in fact, as officials have concluded, take his own life? And why do so many people question the official narrative? To answer this, we're going to have to start by learning a little bit more about the man himself. And this is one of those episodes where, you know, we've still got the facts, still got the crazy, just be very well aware, folks. The facts themselves are pretty insane in this case. So without further ado, here are the facts. Yeah, so let's start with uh, John McAfee's life first. John David McAfee was born on September 18th of 1945 on a United States Army base. Um, Specifically, it was the 569th Ordnance Ammunition Company, and that was in Gloucestershire, England. His father was Don McAfee, uh, an American stationed on that base. While he was born in the United Kingdom, McAfee grew up in Salem, Virginia. Uh, And in 1960, his father tragically took his own life, um, something that may come into play in terms of hereditary factors in McAfee's own passing. Um, McAfee received his bachelor's degree in math from Roanoke College seven years later in 1967, and he would ultimately receive an honorary doctor of science degree from that college. Yeah, and he, you know, originally, at least according to himself, uh, he wanted to keep going down that educational route when, when in 1967 when he got his degree And he was at Northeast Louisiana State College, uh, where he was doing such a thing. Uh, He was trying to get a doctorate in mathematics, not an honorary one, an actual one. And uh, (laughs) he ran into some trouble the next year, 1968. He ended up getting expelled because he had a relationship with an undergrad. And uh, it, it didn't go so great in the educational department, but they did form a family. They got married after after that whole thing happened and that would be number one out of the three of which we are aware yeah and he had numerous uh amorous relationships right outside of marriage both while he was married and while he was legally single uh this first marriage was short-lived uh, when you hear people talking about mcafee himself now and you hear references to his wife, they're talking about his third wife, Janice, yes. who is alive as we record this. So, yeah, we already see some of these contradictions. In later interviews, McAfee goes on to say that he started abusing drugs and alcohol pretty early in life. I don't think he would necessarily use the term abuse. He was a huge proponent of recreational drug use. But we see these contradictions. A guy who was uh, academically pretty on point Uh, But also, you know, uh, considers himself a bit of a Casanova, a bit of a ladies man uh, and, uh, you know, parties in his mind just as hard as he works. Kind of reminds me of almost like a William S. Burroughs figure in that way. Someone who, you know, uh, advocated for the recreational use of drugs and continued to use drugs until the day that he uh, he passed away as well. He probably saw himself as a, a, a sort of Tony Stark figure, right? Tech Narati. Uh, who is beyond cool, 
And, and as we'll see, the cultivation of his public image is something that he spent a great deal of time uh, thinking through. So he, but again, inarguably, the guy is pretty intelligent, right? And I also want to give a shout out uh, to our pal Robert over on Behind the Bastards. Some time ago, they did a two-part episode on McAfee's life, if you'd like to learn more. But that was, I believe that was recorded before McAfee passed away. So he's a smart guy. He goes to work for NASA, an outfit in, in New York from 1968 to 1970, and he's working on the Apollo program. So he's part of space exploration history. But after that, he takes his career to the private sector. He works for Univac as a software designer. Then he moves to Xerox as an operating systems architect. And then he becomes a software consultant at a place with the astonishingly creative name, Computer Sciences Corporation. 1978. <laughs> well, it was a you know it was a new era at that time. You can get away true. with names like that. And also, perhaps presciently, he worked for a firm called Booz Allen Hamilton in the early 80s. Um, and also, you know, while at Lockheed in the mid 80s, he got hipped to uh, IBM uh, and their first computer virus. This was a program called Brain. Um, and in 1986, this awareness of the idea of computer viruses ultimately changed the direction of his career and his life. Uh, he understood that viruses posed a much larger threat than maybe was even realized at the time. Yeah, yeah. They, he saw the shadow they would cast. Just before we move on, you may recognize that name Booz Allen Hamilton if you're listening to this. The reason why I it stuck in my brain is because there's another person who formerly worked for that company that person's name is Edward Snowden, and uh, they, you know, the company has a very close link with some of the intelligence services within the United States. So that that may be a reason why you've heard of them as well. It's a good web, and it's a great catch, Matt. Ed shows up in today's episode later as well. Before we move on, I do want to say one thing in defense of the virus known as brain. First of its kind that people really clocked came out in 1986, but the story behind it is fascinating. Even though it's not really relevant to this episode, it was created by these two, uh, this pair of Pakistani brothers, and they didn't really have an ill intention. They like almost like someone in a stadium in a sports game who tries to start a wave. You know, yeah, you, you got to be brave or kind of drunk to try to start a wave on your own. Uh, they they were trying to do that. They didn't really want to upset, you know, financial apple carts or anything. They literally just thought it was a cool idea and they wanted like someone doing a wave at a stadium to see how far it could travel. How do we know? Because they put like their real names and contact information in the code and the virus itself uh, was named after their physical computer shop. I'm just saying they weren't trying to be like shadowy and secret. Uh, they were like, oh, hey, tell us if our cool thing works. And that's when <laughs> McAfee was like, oh, shit. This could be the end of the world. And he set up on his mission. This leads us, like Noel was saying, this, this is a milestone, a turning point for him. He understands the danger viruses and malware could create. And so he immediately goes to work making antivirus software with the goal of automatically detecting and automatically removing similar programs. By the next year, he's founded McAfee Associates Incorporated to sell this software. It is the first of its kind commercially available. And it's weird because he's selling something that fixes a problem most people at this point don't understand is a problem. It's also a time where not nearly as many crucial systems, things like vehicles, even, for example, or infrastructure, um, you know, maintenance were run by computers. Um, it's something that he really did kind of see the future of and uh, take action. And uh, while we will all come to associate McAfee uh, software with uh, sort of inconvenience and maybe not being the most efficient at what it was setting out to do, the fact that he had that idea speaks to his uh, his brilliance. Agreed. Yeah, in in that regard, for sure. And he's he's fighting a battle on two fronts, or at least his goals are twofold. First, yeah, making money is important. He's not a volunteer. He is selling this. But secondly, he needs to 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 make those sales. He needs to spread awareness about the danger of this new phenomenon. 
and he was successful on both fronts. That's why today McAfee remains a well-known software brand, though, as we as we've implied, uh, a controversial one that is known for having its hiccups and being imperfect. By 1990, in the early 1990s, he uh, McAfee was making about five million dollars a year. Nothing to sneeze at, but at the same time that he was bawling out financially, he was getting more and more disillusioned with the company that he founded. He was beginning to sour on the enterprise. And so you'll see like he, he takes steps away from like being in executive management. He takes further and further steps back, kind of like Jeff Bezos. And then in 1993, he sells off everything he owns in the company and then starts talking trash about them. For oh, the yeah. rest of his life, he hates oh, them. Oh, yeah, he does. He hates them with a passion. Um, it, it makes sense, though, that he would be bad at managing a company. Like, he seems like more of the idea man and less the, like, nuts and bolts kind of day-to-day kind of dude, you know? I don't know if I would want to do an escape room with him. Probably not. <laughs> he would just have a forty-five holster and just start shooting holes and things. <laughs> he would be like, hang on, all right, guys, first things first. Where do you think they put the cocaine? And we're like, yeah. uh, I don't know, man. Escape rooms don't usually have cocaine. He's like, I've got a new business idea. Mm-hmm. And then Jeez. he just starts tearing the room apart from the studs looking for the stash. <laughs> Start an escape room that's all it's all cocaine based, and he'll just figure out the legalities later. Can I just give you a reference for what I'm thinking about there? Because uh in, in 2013, John McAfee started a YouTube channel, and I want to say it was the first video he uploaded was titled how to uninstall. Yeah. How to uninstall McAfee antivirus. Mm-hmm. It's the first video he put up and it, it does just what we're discussing here. He starts talking trash about McAfee antivirus software. Then he proceeds to do bath salts. It's with a thing that says bath salts and starts doing that with a bunch of scantily clad women. And he's trying to figure out how to uninstall McAfee antivirus software. And his solution is to shoot a hole into the laptop. Oh, well, there you go. It's also like, I mean, when this, I remember when this came out and I was not aware of the connection between this, this person and then the software. I just assumed it was, I didn't even, I didn't even understand there was a person involved, but uh, he's obviously making this kind of as a joke, a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, I thought it was a, a, an absolute joke. This was some kind of actor playing like this character that was this unhinged, you know, antivirus impresario, but quickly found out that it was true. He's also wearing like a Hugh Hefner style kind of smoking jacket. And um, I think it's, it's pretty clearly a, a fake background that looks like some sort of drawing room in like a, a country estate, perhaps. He was going for those big Dosaki's most interesting man vibes. Boom. Mm-hmm. Nailed it. Nailed it. That's what he's he's on a propaganda mission in, in a very real way. And you know, you'll admit, you'll have to admit, there are times where he is funny in interviews, like where he genuinely says some uh, amusing, insightful stuff, but being funny doesn't make you a good person, which I hopefully is not. A common misconception anyway yeah so he he also holds a grudge for serious for real forever and the company mcafee is high on his shit list and he is has no hesitation about saying so in fact you get the sense he looks forward to talking about how much he hates them intel eventually takes over mcafee in 2010 in that summer and for a lot of money, by the way, seven point four billion, I think mm-hmm. it's a ton because they were McAfee. You know, uh, regardless of whether or not you think it it works well today, it was the first of its kind to market. So that's mm-hmm. a huge deal, and people were already kind of path dependent because they had it on their computers. They didn't know, you know, they were scared to not have it. So Intel sees the value in this. They take over for a time. They try to change the brand name to Intel security. McAfee is over the moon about this. He goes public and he says, quote, I am now everlastingly grateful to Intel for freeing me from this terrible association with the worst software on the planet. He was uh, was a little premature in his celebration, though, folks, because eventually the brand name switched back to McAfee. Again, they're the first in the game. That brand recognition is priceless to marketing, and it still operates under that name to this day. But 
as we will find, there is much, much more to this man's story than just the business bearing his name. He was an object of fascination, controversy, and tons of criticism in his adult years. Uh, the guy, if the guy was a D and D character, he did not like. Uh, honestly, diplomacy was his dump stat. He didn't particularly care to be uh, diplomatic or worry too much about his bedside manner when he had a disagreement with someone. And he was he, uh, he was a libertarian. Uh, he had views that a lot of people would consider extreme, such as his belief that taxation itself, the concept, the practice was illegal. Uh oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the I mean, that's how they got Capone. Right. Uh, he also openly admitted to deceiving people about Bitcoin. And this is this is just one of the many controversies, but it's a more recent one. He had a massive following on Twitter and he leveraged that to get people on board with the idea of cryptocurrency in 2019. And then just a little bit later, January 2020, he's back on Twitter and he's like, yeah, you know, that was a ruse. It was a scheme. Those statements, I, I made those statements just to get more people on board with cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how much money did he make? And was it's, it a pump and dump? It's Yeah, that's still weird to me that it's illegal for somebody who it, in some way isn't like connected directly with a, a currency. And I don't know, I don't even know how to wrap my head around this, but it makes sense if it's somebody with a ton of holdings that have shareholders and they're like manipulating the system. That makes sense to me why that would be illegal. It doesn't make sense to me why somebody who just uh, one person who has a financial stake in something can't big up the thing in order to make more money. That's weird to me. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing whatever statute it is that spells that out and like how, how it actually uh, is phrased. Cause you're right. I mean, it's essentially using your public persona and your following for personal financial gain. But how is that any different than like, say, pimping out a product or something like that? Or, um, you know, just literally promoting yourself and like your, your films or something like that. Yeah. Like the self as brand, right? That's something that's very popular in the age of ubiquitous communication. I think it's the knowingness of it all, like knowing that what he's planning to do is big up it and then dump it. And if that can be proven, then that. I mean, obviously, it's uh, ethically <laughs> dubious at best, but uh, I can see why there could be some statute that spells out what makes that illegal. And there should be. The Southern District of New York filed charges uh, saying that the, this was fraud and money laundering because they were they were making money in a way that circumvented disclosure to investors. And, you know, honestly, that's how that's how a lot of people end up in jails when you mess with the money. If you're powerful enough, people let a lot of things slide. But when you start messing with the bank accounts, uh, that's that's when the sleeping giants awake. And you can, you can read the charges uh, against him for the allegations of crypto fraud. Uh, they were published on, or they went public on March 5th, 2021. So it goes back to the idea that they were swindling investors in what are called ICOs or initial coin offerings. That's where you can, you know, buy crypto when it like hits the quote unquote market. So they were making money in illegal ways. That's what the charges were. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot like the story we covered recently about the FaZe Clan gamer kind of crew that was, uh, you know, kind of rigging these charity ICOs uh, and doing a similar pump and dump kind of situation, just a slightly lower profile because he really was just screaming it from the rooftops. McAfee was like he did everything pretty much, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not, not much of a whisper guy, but uh, he, so he gets this, he gets this criticism and he, you know, he's getting in trouble in 2019, 2020, but he's, this is not stopping him. We'll jump around in time just a bit. After he leaves the software company he founded, he goes on to create a number of very short-lived businesses. Everything for like a lot of it's in the tech space, everything from a firewall concept to uh, instant messaging IM system to a ranch that gives you trike flights. And these were like hang gliders with a cabin in them. You would fly on there. So, you know, he's not all tech, I guess. Uh, but the story takes a big turn 
when he travels down south. How far south are we talking? We're talking about Central America. So I propose we pause for a word from our sponsor and return to join John McAfee in Belize. Okay, and we're back. And now we are in Belize, in Central America. It is 2008. John McAfee is there. He, according to the story, was there to start a company called Quorum EX, which had a very interesting goal. He wanted to sell herbal antibiotics. Hmm. Okay. Move to Belize, sell herbs. That's and the dream. Th- yes. And these could allegedly, according to the company, disrupt, quote, quorum sensing in bacteria. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So correct me if I'm wrong here, Ben, but my understanding of quorum sensing is almost exactly what it says with the words. Uh, (laughs) The bacteria will form a quorum at some point when there are enough of them together because they use um, particular biochemical signals to uh, not decide what they're going to do or when or how. But when they all get together, (laughs) signals are sent back and forth and uh, via the quorum. (laughs) And these things were going to disrupt the the signals, essentially. You've got the parliamentarian bacteria, you know, you've got the, it's like, it's like Congress, basically. Well, I mean, Um, but yeah, that means when bacteria, when enough bacteria gets together and you get a colony, that's when things can go really wrong. Totally. Yeah. Quorum sensing allows colonies of bacteria to, it gives them production coordination. It it lets them carry out collectively any number of things that could be great for that colony and bacteria, but maybe not so great for other things like human beings. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an idea that has a sound basis. Um, We just don't know whether there was efficacy to those herbal antibiotics or whether or not he was actually doing that thing or not. (laughs) He is the epitome of an unreliable narrator. That is true. So things progressed with this business until about 2012 when a part of Belize's police force called the Gang Suppression Unit does a kick door. They bust into the Quorum X research lab based on the suspicion that they have. They feel like the reliable intel has informed them uh, this is actually a methamphetamine lab and that they're not making herbal (laughs) antibiotics. They're making crystal. And so the authorities go hard on this guy. They uh, take all, they confiscate all his weapons. And if you've seen in the interviews uh, regarding guns and weaponry with him. You know, he's a gun nut. He loved it. He never had enough guns. He said, I only feel safe if I'm in bed with a gun and the door is locked. Yes. Yeah. Notoriously paranoid. Yes. Uh, and he also, the thing is with those guns, they were all licensed. They were legal for him to own them. And the authorities also took his passport, meaning he could not legally leave Belize They also shot the dog he had at the time. They threw him in prison. Ultimately, they dropped all the charges. Yeah, and according to reports from the authorities, when they got there to arrest him, he was in bed with a 16-year-old girl. Um, This is one of many allegations of this type that we're going to hear as the story progresses. Um, It really was only the beginning of his troubles in this country. That same year, he had a neighbor that he was constantly (laughs) in uh, dispute with, a guy by the name of Gregory Fall. They had some disagreements about McAfee's dogs. Uh, He was uh, really into dogs. He had nine of them, and um, Fall believed that they were uh, a menace, or at the very least a nuisance. Uh, I've seen a lot of reports that they were, like, mean. I'm sure. I mean, the guy strikes me as the type of dude that would uh, encourage that type of behavior. He's all about self-protection, and he's all about, you know, having some sort of perimeter. I'm sure he trained the dogs to to be very vicious. I mean, it it makes sense. It tracks with his personality. Um, By the way, this guy, Gregory Fall, was was found dead with a gunshot wound to the head. Back of the head. Yeah, I I do want to, before we we get in the details of this, which is another pivotal event in his life, Uh, Right up there with learning about computer viruses, Matt, uh, in your research, you found something that I thought was just a very telling encapsulation of McAfee's attitude and his communication style. Absolutely. Um, After 
All of this happened in 2012, and he went on the lam, as they say, with his with his wife at the time, I believe. He was making those those videos on YouTube in 2013. We talked about the first one. The fourth video that he published was titled John McAfee Tells All Slash Raw. And in this one, he's in his same outfit, Noel, that you liked so much. He's in his same backdrop, and he is... It's he's doing a tell all and he's answering to all of the public discussion that's happening in the news about him and his activities and specifically about his neighbor, Craig. And in this, he's being silly again, but he's also being serious and it's weird. He rides that line in such a weird way. He says, a lot of people are asking me questions. Here are the four most popular factual questions. One. Did I murder my neighbor in Belize? Oh, okay. Let's just get right to it. Two, was I manufacturing illegal drugs in Central America? Jeez, that's what the cops think. Three, was I having sex with underage girls? That's literally what the cops said. And was I using bath salts? I can answer a resounding no to all three of those questions. But which one was a yes? We don't know. We don't know. I mean, he, he's, he supposedly was doing bath salts in that previous video you described, Matt, but I think it was like literally like a, like a container that said bath salts yes. on it, like it yes. was meant to be very tongue-in-cheek. So it's it's the spectacle of it, you know? Uh, and he also made a lot of enemies. It wasn't just his neighbor. Uh, he alleges that some of the charges against him were simply politically motivated because he refused to donate to uh, a campaign fund for local politician that lived in his neighborhood. Yeah, he called them bribes, like dr- all just straight up bribes. Right. And then when they jammed him up with some stuff, they came back and they said, hey, how do you wait? What do you think about donating to the campaign now? Have you changed your mind? And then his answer was yes, because now you have pissed me off. Right. And this is his <laughs> own retelling. Yeah. Right. He's like earlier. I didn't care. Now I'm angry at you. But Ben. Don't you think it's a little weird that they raided his compound, shot his dog, did all of that stuff? I think that was in 2012, right? When that happened. Isn't it weird that that occurred? They threw him in jail and then they dropped all the charges. Like, yeah, if something was going on, but I'm trying to imagine the scenarios. If something was going on, they found some stuff. They put him in jail. He either bribed them or pay them off to get out of jail or they just dropped the charges because nothing was happening. Those are the only two things I can imagine. Or it wasn't meant to stick. It was an intimidation. They were putting him on notice. Okay. All right. That's the possibility. Yeah, but, sure. you know, I, I don't mean to sound too old school about it, but I think killing someone's dog is something. That's literally what led to all those John Wick movies, you guys. I mean, you know. So, yeah, this the, the neighbor before his death is also politically active. He has written to the mayor about the issue with McAfee's dogs. And then the neighbor also, Fall also doesn't like the company that's on the McAfee compound. He says, you know, this guy is surrounded by these dangerous trigger happy bodyguards. And there are a lot, a lot of girls showing up there. And I believe they are underage. So he is like he. He has what he feels are legitimate grievances, and it's important to know it's more than just those nine dogs. Yeah. So given all this, and then later, you know, as you said, Noel and Matt, the guy's found with a gunshot to the back of his head. And he's been uh, tasered multiple times. And he's been tasered multiple times. There is a shell casing found like on the stairs leading mm-hmm. to the second floor. No forcible entry. No items taken from the house. Sorry. No, no. Right, right. No, you're right. Because they kept the doors to the first floor open so that air would circulate to the second floor. So mm-hmm. you could just walk. Someone walked in and shot him and nobody thought it was a suicide. With all this information, you can see why the authorities of Belize whether you consider them crooked or not, you can see how in this case they were like, yeah, we should probably talk to his neighbor, yeah. you know? And, and so they, they knew like his reputation, these earlier disagreements. He was a notoriously hot headed dude. So they go to uh, question him. McAfee maintains his innocence. In fact, he later writes an open letter to the family of the murder victim and offers a $25,000 reward for information regarding the death. But he never gives the police of Belize a chance to talk to him or interview him. 
he immediately, very publicly, goes on the run. And he, he like, he disguises himself. Uh, he's, he's dyed his hair. He's stained his teeth. He said he dressed like a raggedy salesman and didn't bathe for several days. Uh, but what do we mean when we say he very publicly went on the lamb? It was his golden age for interviews. He yep. was everywhere uh, soaking up the publicity. And it was partially um, the allure, I think, of notoriety and fame. But it was also, in a very real sense, uh, uh, an insurance policy. Yeah, you can always find me, right? I'm, I'm in the news all over the place. And I'm making dates, essentially, on my calendar to have interviews. So if he goes missing or something like that, it's just very brazen, isn't it? It's like it's almost like a bit that he's doing, like in a similar way. Those YouTube videos are a bit like why bother disguising yourself and going through all that trouble when you're just kind of like out yourself publicly in that way. It seems like he's he's, he's literally saying I'm invincible. Come at me, bro. I'm not scared. Well, what if he really believes like I'm just and I'm just putting out this. I don't necessarily believe this, but what if he really does truly believe that the authorities in Belize are out to get him for something, whatever that thing is. And what, and, and so if we understand that, then maybe it explains his actions a little better. I, I don't, I don't know. It, it's tough to put ourselves in that his shoes, especially if you believe that he killed his neighbor, there are some scenarios where he does and doesn't kill his neighbor. So we just, we don't know. Yeah, it's important. That's a good point, Matt, because it's important to understand that from his perspective, the way he's explained it, this um, fleeing the authorities is only a reaction to an escalating pattern of like harassment and intimidation. That's that's the way that he typically frames it. And how do we know that? Because, again, he did so many interviews on the run and he claimed that there was a conspiracy of foot against him, that if he were thrown in jail in Belize, he would be silenced because of shadowy forces that were afraid of the information he possessed. This is the beginning of his time alluding to what's called a dead hand system or a dead man switch or a kill switch. And that's, you know, if you've listened to this show for a while, you're familiar with this. Um, a lot of countries, a lot of powerful individuals and organizations have things like this. The idea is that you set up, just a quick and dirty idea, is that you set up a system or mechanism of some sort that requires you to check in to verify your safety, freedom, and health at, you know, any given frequency. And then when you fail that check in or when you don't make that verification, it triggers an automated mechanism to release whatever your uh, blackmail or your compromat is. It's pretty yeah. effective when it works. But the big question for a lot of people in the conspiracy world now is how come we hear so much about these, but we don't see them? It's sort of like the informational equivalent of having like a suicide vest on or something and saying, you know, if you if you attack me, you're all going to go down with me. Um, yeah, but it can if, literally be as simple as a, an email timer. Totally. Right? Or, or like a text. That's all can, it's got to be. Or a social media post. I mean, there's mm -hmm. like, we all know that so many uh, social media managers use these very elaborate scheduling systems where, you know, they don't do it when it comes out. They have them scheduled weeks in advance sometimes. And that would be just as uh, probably more effective, honestly, is releasing this stuff like as a tweet to everyone. Or it could be more targeted. Yeah, absolutely. And this, this is going to play a big role in the story, which continues to unfold today. So he had clearly, he had made a calculation, clearly. And his logic was, uh, like we said, that by staying in the public eye, he was safer than he would be if he was fully like off the grid underground. He even had a blog that he updated on the regular. Uh, he was underground for about a month and a half. And <laughs> during this time, you will, I'm, I'm laughing because this is a weird statement. During this time, the government of Belize is trying in a way to play a little bit nice, because at least in their public statements. We don't know what goes on in the back rooms, right? The prime minister at the time, a guy named Dean Barrow, seems at a loss because the government's continually saying, look, again, hey, John, if you're listening, we haven't officially called you a murder suspect. We just, we're your person of interest because you're the neighbor. You love guns. You got a temper. We're just saying there's no smoking gun, but we need to talk to you to investigate this crime. And at one point, when he's referring to McAfee, 
D, uh, Prime Minister Barrow says, I don't want to be unkind to the gentleman, but I believe he's extremely paranoid, even uh, bonkers. Which is exactly what you would say if you wanted to paint him as a, like as a crazy person. But maybe <laughs> he's watching it, Matt, and he's going, yeah, bonkers like a fox. <laughs> I just don't know that uh, he really needed any help painting himself as a bit of a paranoiac uh uh, nut job. Um, but Agreed. I'm just trying to ride this line here, guys. Let's keep let's keep it going. Being paranoid does not inherently uh, conflate to being delusional. Absolutely not. And you're right. There is there are signs that uh, something was going on. I mean, he he, he may well have had it coming, um, but I, I I have no doubt that that he had some very powerful enemies. Oh yeah, of course. And and uh, he his run would have continued longer, most likely, if it were not for an accident on the part of Vice. Vice Magazine, Vice Media, uh, they, they've done some really great work, you know, uh, but in this case, they, they were following along with him. They were with him while he was on the run or for part of his journey, and they made a misstep, a very, an easy misstep to make, and, and, and in all likelihood, an honest mistake. They weren't trying to get them busted is what we're saying. They uploaded a photo to their website that contained location data. And this revealed that by this point, uh, McAfee had crossed international borders and he was in Guatemala illegally, remember? And this at this point, multiple governments are paying attention. They want to find him. And, you know, one thing that was odd to me about this is McAfee doesn't seem really mad at the people involved. He's a very paranoid dude, but he also believes it's just an honest mistake, which seems counterintuitive to what we know about him, right? Yeah, surprisingly even handed for him. This stood out to me. He's like, we immediately had to go on the run again because we we're in Guatemala illegally at this point. But it was no one's real fault. It was just the fault of the moment. Wow. I like that language. That's good. The fault of the moment. Um, he was caught in December uh, in Guatemala, um, and he, he actually faked two separate heart attacks, which knowing we know about his uh, predilection for, you know, certain extracurricular substances, tracks, um, in order to avoid deportation to Belize. And in many ways, I mean, in the only way that really matters, I guess it worked because he was instead deported to Miami. And what do you do after you've been arrested multiple times? <laughs> and <laughs> Should only wanted fugitive. Yeah. You know what you do, Matt. You run for president. That's, that's exactly what you do. He was like the he was like the proto Joe Exotic. You know what I mean? Like really wild. Yeah, he was. Uh, he's, I don't know his opinion on tigers, but he was wild. Uh, it's so weird. We're just a friendly reminder, fellow conspiracy realists. We're not at the crazy part yet. This is just this guy's life as it actually happened, and it's already pretty extraordinary. Matt, you're absolutely right. He goes to he goes to Miami. He's deported. He's not going back to Belize. And in 2015, he announces that he will run as a candidate uh, for the Cyber Party, Ooh. presidency of the United States of America. The Cyber Party, as you know, <laughs> is um, not the most prominent political organization in the U.S. Uh, so later he switches to the Libertarian Party, which makes sense because he himself you know, has espoused these views. Yeah, I feel like a kid in middle school learning about what cybering is uh ooh la la like, yep. <laughs> it sounds like cyber king well it was always so funny when like trump for example or any kind of like you know slightly out of touch uh politician refers to just the internet at large as the cyber you know yeah it's you know i i wish we as a nation acknowledge that more often i'm not picking on any particular political party here i'm just saying should the people who don't know how to open email be in charge of laws about email? So, spoiler alert, folks, he does not become the president of the U.S. In 2020, you know, he says, hey, maybe second time's a charm. He runs again, and this time he's running in exile. He's on a boat. He's in international waters. Uh, he says he's doing this to stay away, to be out of reach 
of the IRS because he is fleeing charges of felony tax evasion. How do you run for president of the same country that's trying to arrest you? He had a V for Vendetta plan. This is a true story. When asked about this, he said, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to print thousands of McAfee masks and my followers will all wear them. And we'll, you know, we'll have like flash mobs and we'll have, he called them road warriors. Yep. said, first, our road warriors will go out once a month to appear in parks and street corners and restaurants all around America. While I, like the mask would have like, or these people would be carrying loudspeakers and he would speak through the loudspeaker. While everyone looks at the masked faces. Yeah. Which is like, do you want that guy in charge of your country? For sure. I mean, he could definitely, he would kick ass at community theater. It's like a really terrifying street team, you know, or like a campaign. Um, it seems to be based on intimidation and just absolute weirdness. Um, so he paid all the fees and everything, you guys? Like he really went, like he did it, he did it right? Or was it more just a, you know, a PR stunt? Yeah. Open question. Good question. Um, it can be hard to ascribe his motivations, you know, or hard to divine them, I should say, uh, as far as whether this was all a publicity stunt or whether he genuinely believed that he would be a good pick for the highest office in the land. I tend to think that he was serious about it. I tend to think he genuinely wanted to make a go for it, but he, uh, he didn't, wasn't successful. Uh, fast forward October 2020, he is arrested in Spain at the request of Uncle Sam. Yes, he's accused of dodging tax returns for four years, uh, despite raking in millions and millions of dollars, at least the IRS says, from his work with consulting, cryptocurrencies. He's still in trouble for that. Speaking engagements they charged for. He also sold his life rights um, because who doesn't want a movie about themselves? Uh, he also got accused of hiding cash and hiding assets by putting them in other people's names, you know, which is why like Matt, Noel, and I all have, you know, we all have yachts, but they're all really Paul's yachts. The guy just has too many yachts. It's true. My big question here, guys, and I, I don't remember reading this in, in my research, is uh, so he got arrested at one point after the whole Guatemala Vice thing. He got deported to Florida how long was he there? Did, when did he get released from prison that time to then get picked up again? I, I just don't, I didn't understand the timeline and I couldn't find it. Yeah, it was a little, it was a little weird too. I don't think he was, I don't think it was locked up when he got to Miami. Oh, I think it was just deported. They mm -hmm. just got him out of there. Okay. That was my misunderstanding. Thanks guys. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, but in March he was indicted. <laughs> So they didn't lock him up right away, but he was indicted on uh, other charges, including fraud and money laundering. Um, the U.S. Justice Department was now on his tail, alleging that he and a uh, unnamed business partner um, defrauded investors of around $13 million by, like we talked about earlier, falsely promoting cryptocurrencies. And McAfee, um, he fought these charges and claimed that he was being targeted by some kind of shadowy cabal uh, that was after him for personal reasons. Um, these were the very same forces that he would allege have been chasing him across the entire globe. He never really says who exactly they are, uh, but uh, they seem pretty powerful and pretty scary and that they want him dead. Or at least that's, you know, the urgency with which he's describing these things. Um, as that particular legal case went forward, Spain ruled in favor of the extradition, um, concluding that there was, quote, no revealing data or indication that Mr. McAfee could be subjected to any political persecution. Uh, then, as we know, um, on June 23rd, John McAfee was found dead in his cell. And authorities reached the conclusion they maintain today that John McAfee took his own life. Would you be surprised to learn some people think there's a conspiracy afoot. Would you be surprised to know that Ben is holding a spear, a tactical spear, in <laughs> across his back <laughs> as he says this? <laughs> it's a spear summer for me, man. I don't know what to tell you. But of course, absolutely no one's surprised to learn people are questioning the official narrative. So at this point, we're going to pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll return to the day of McAfee's death. Thank you. 
here's where it gets crazy. Finally, right? It's already been kind of crazy, but now we're at the moment, the death of John McAfee. First, we did his life. Now we're at the part where he dies. McAfee's body was found in a cell at the Brian's Two Penitentiary Center, which is uh, located close to Barcelona. And this, he was found dead just a few hours after the Spanish National Court greenlit his extradition. He was 75 years old at the time. The authorities concluded this, that he was alone at the time of his death, that he took his life via hanging. A later autopsy confirms this by Spanish authorities, uh, but his widow, Janice, requested a second autopsy immediately upon release of that first autopsy. And today she is one of the many people claiming that McAfee did not commit suicide, but he was in fact murdered. His lawyer also seems skeptical at the very least. That's right. His lawyer, uh, Javier Villalba said, quote, at no point had he shown any special worry or clue that could let us think this could have happened. Um, similar to the kinds of sentiments we heard after the alleged suicide of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and a very similar flood of internet uh, conspiracy theory, speculation, uh, rumors, you know, just going wild. The It's got the internet going nuts, as they say. Um, and a lot of this was because, I mean, McAfee's been laying the groundwork for this for his entire life. For years, especially leading up to uh, his demise. And it's tough to trace all the strings of this web, uh, due in part to his love of being a showman and an unreliable narrator. Like, for an example, multiple times he refused to acknowledge how much wealth he did or did not possess, how much money he made or lost in a given endeavor. And there's one interview, and we'll play a clip from this, where he admits that he just makes up answers when people ask him how much he's worth. And really, it's nobody's business. And so the numbers that I throw out are numbers that I just randomly feel like throwing out. If the number four looks good today, I'll say I'm worth four million. You know? If uh, four, the number 44 was the, the, the first two numbers of the, the lottery winner yesterday, I'll say, well, 44 million. You know? It's meaningless. Leave nothing I say when it comes to my work. You know? So that's weird. But to your point, Noel, um, he was actively urging people to uh to refuse any official narrative that said he committed suicide and he got very explicit with this on social media yeah on november 30th 2019 he made this tweet quote getting subtle messages from u.s officials saying in effect we're coming for you mcafee we're going to kill yourself Jeez. do you hear that right we're uh -huh. going to kill yourself I, and uh, then he said, I got a tattoo today just in case if I suicide myself. I didn't. I was whacked. Check my right arm. And it says, I believe money sign whacked. W-H-A-C-K-D. And then on October 15th, 2020, while he's in jail in Spain, uh, he posts the following or someone posts for him the following on Twitter. Quote, I am content in here. I have friends. The food is good. All is well. Know that if I hang myself, a la Epstein, it will be no fault of mine. Mm hmm. Yeah, a little Jeez weird. Um, and oh, here's one more thing to note. Roughly 60 minutes after the, the public was made aware that he was dead, the official Instagram account of John McAfee posted, then deleted, simply the letter Q. And, Is that a reference to Q, uh, may I, QAnon? I mean, like, come really on, trying guys. to stir things up. Yeah. I mean, he's just really laying it on thick, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, with this one, it seems like you'll find some arguments that this Instagram post after his death was by one of his followers and that like one of someone who was associated with him was actually running the account. But yeah, you can see how this clearly looks yeah. like some something is messed up in conspiracy land. So if he did not actually take his own life, the next question would be who did and why? If we're just you know exploring this concept, if you go back to Twitter, you see that he believes he has a nemesis. He says on June 9th, 2019, I've collected files on corruption in governments for the first time. I'm naming names and specifics. I'll begin with a corrupt CIA agent and two Bahamanian officials. Coming today, if I'm arrested or disappear, 31 plus terabytes of incriminating data will be released to the press. That's also explicitly like I've got a dead hand. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. So that was 2019 in June. Then in August of 2020, he again affirms, confirms, tells everyone, I've got this thing that's going to trigger if anything happens to me. He specifically writes, quote, if I'm arrested or disappear or die, every news outlet on the planet will be told the truth. Those in power, if they have any sense, will pray that I live free to 100. This is interesting. We'll get to who he's alluding to, but clearly he believes facets of the U.S. government are after him, right? And we'll, we'll find out why in just a second. So before his death, his wife claims the U.S. government, she predicts that the U.S. government will have a hand in his murder. And uh, she says that the U.S. authorities are determined to have John die in prison and make an example of him for speaking out against the corruption within their government agencies. Edward Snowden returns to the public square. Uh, He argues against extradition in general, given what happens to a lot of people if they're extradited to the U.S. And he warns that, in his opinion, Julian Assange could be next. Here's what McAfee says happened. There's an interview where he claims that he had been spying on the NSA, that he had sold them a ton of computers, and he had secretly built into those computers the capability to monitor the U.S. government. And this information that he claims to have attained made him a target for Uncle Sam. And if you hear him talk about it, he is pretty vague regarding what he Mm -hmm. exactly found. If you hear him talk about it, he had learned the stuff they don't want you to know, and the U.S. would go to any lengths, legal or illegal, to keep that information secret. That's what he said. Why in the hell would the U.S. government buy computers from John McAfee? I think, as we've learned from John McAfee, he likes to throw up smoke screens. Right. And if he did actually have something, I think it would be related to the McAfee antivirus software. We have mentioned this before on the show, but I don't know how in depth we've gone into it. I'm looking at my computer right here. I have an antivirus software installed through our company. What that software does is it scans every file that comes through your computer. It scans every time you connect something to your computer. It scans every network connection you ever make. It knows what is happening on your computer. Does that mean it can actually open and read all of the files? Like, can it actually look at a text document or a picture or a video? I I don't believe it has that capability, especially back in, you know, what, 1994 is when he left antivirus software behind. But I do believe he could have it is is it, it is at least possible that he could have put something into that antivirus software or used it in a way that would have allowed him to see into government-owned and operated computers. Like a backdoor kind of situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is possible. It is. Um, He may also have, because we have to remember, again, by being the first of its kind, McAfee uh, as a business was near ubiquitous for a while, right? And they were making big contracts for a great number of computers, for a great number of services. So it is not impossible at the very least. And that's part of why people are running on overdrive, sussing out possible connections, some a little bit fantastical, uh, but then others disturbingly plausible. And right now, as we're recording, the true believers do think a dead hand has been activated. They do think there is a kill switch. Uh, They believe that it is oncoming, like it's it's on the way. Um, One thing you'll find referenced is a website called BritBongLogPost.biz. You guys saw that one? It's a great URL. (laughs) It's fun to say. Sure is. Um, But it's uh, all it is is it's it's like this one page where there's a countdown that's like 15 days and something as we record, and then a, a couple of cryptic short messages. Something big is coming. All the right people are scared, and they should be. Oh, and there's an EtherScan.io link here that you can click on that i'm not going to oh i shouldn't have clicked on it i guess no you know etherscan is just like uh it's it's just a tracker for ethereum transactions uh, in the same way that like there's one for every currency i think for the most part but it is an open record of all uh ethereum exchanges yeah so that's the idea it'll be released through ethereum uh wow i mean that's oh no it's a token it's a I'm, i'm sorry it's a it's a token it is a token that he that has been created called Whacked. Whoa. 
Yeah, it's, oh, a, it's a token shoot. called WHCKD. Um, and there is a supply. It, it gives you the supply. There are 29,909 holders, and uh, uh, there have been 148,997 transfers. And you can see that whole record. I wonder what the deal is with that, if this is literally just a, uh, a scam to try to boost this currency or if he actually had something to do with it. We don't know. We're not the right people. Yeah. This website's for the right people to be scared. I guess it must have right. been Phase Clan again. Phase Clan, <laughs> shake your fist at the sky. No, I, but that's like that's the thing. That's what's so tantalizing and fascinating about this is that there is literally a ticking clock. Whether or not that ticking clock is legit remains to be seen. At this point, there have been no posthumous revelations from yeah. McAfee or his state. As far as the official narrative goes, that is the end of the story. He was threatened with extradition, the very real possibility of spending his life in the U.S. prison, because remember, he's 75. Uh, the charges that he was facing could could have landed him in prison for 30 years, you know, not even counting any cryptocurrency stuff. So they argue that he took the opportunity to end his own life via hanging while he was alone. That's right. He had a cellmate. The cellmate was not present. That's another thing people point out. And something that we have to mention here, Reuters put out a story that John McAfee had attempted suicide in February, in late February, in the same prison cell. Uh, and, uh, you know, who knows? That's a message from authorities. It's whether or not you believe them, that if it's true or not. There's no video of him in that attempt. He was put on suicide watch, much in the same way Jeffrey Epstein was. So it's some of the mirroring that's happening here with how those two men were handled in prison is is weirding me out. Right, right. You know, it's it's not enough for us to say uh, that they are like clearly related, mm -mm. et cetera, or anything really definitive. But the correlations are eerie. So th that's the issue. This story continues after the official conclusions. The government of Spain has reached its conclusion and they haven't shown that they're going to reopen the investigation or anything like that. Theories about McAfee's death have caught the attention of the QAnon crowd and many people, regardless of their beliefs on QAnon, they remain convinced that there is somewhere out there a treasure trove of blackmail and secrets that will be released in the near future. If such a cache exists and if it does get released, it will be one of the strongest pieces of evidence for those theories surrounding his death. But here's the tricky thing. Here's the devil of it all. No matter what happens, what does or does not see the light of day, for decades to come, people are going to be convinced that McAfee was murdered, you know? And now we have to pass it to you. I mean, what, what do you think, folks? Do you think he took his own life? Do you think he was suicided? How much um, credence would you put in his public statements and the statements of people uh, who believe something other than the official conclusion. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us in the normal social media places. On Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, we are Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. You, oh, check out Here's Where It Gets Crazy. That's our Facebook page. You can chat with all the other conspiracy realists. I bet there will be some great threads about this episode going, so check that out for sure. Absolutely. You can also reach us via telephone um, at one eight three three S T D W Y T K. You got three minutes. Um, please let us know what to call you. If you have a nickname, we're all about nicknames here. And you might hear yourself and your story on one of our weekly uh, listener mail episodes. Also, if you feel like you got more that you want to tell us that won't fit in that three minutes, why not send us a supplementary email? You can do that by writing to us at conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.